Hello and welcome to Ahead of the Curve. I am Jonathan Gellner, and thank you so much for being here. This episode is brought to you by Baseball Cloud. Go to BaseballCloud.com to find out how you can have your own data analytics department for your program. Data has a story to tell, and Baseball Cloud gives it a voice. In this episode, I get the privilege of speaking with LSU head baseball coach Paul Maneri. We hit on what he's learned in his almost 40 years of head coaching experience, and we also talk about the value of relationships with our players and our coaches. He also gives us his best advice for any assistant coaches who would like to be head coaches someday. Here is Paul Maneri. Coach Maneri, welcome. Uh, Jonathan, how are you? I'm doing well, and yourself? I'm great, great. Love being here in Virginia. Definitely. Well, uh, welcome to Virginia. This is my first, well, second day here as well. And th- throughout your 30 years of, th- well, 37 years of coaching experience, you know, tell, take us a little bit through that. You mentioned you were a high school co- coach earlier, and I just want to know a little bit about your journey. And, you know, what would you offer some of our guys who are, you know, in their first or second year? And, you know, what would you tell yourself? Just walk us through one and then, you know, offer some advice to those guys. Well, I'll tell you this, Jonathan, as we were talking before we went on to the podcast, and I look at you, I see myself. You know, it just seems like yesterday that I was 20-something years old. You just turned 30, you told me. And I just started out in the profession, and I was hoping, you know, that I that I could get a job, then work with kids and try to impact some lives. And all of a sudden, you know, I'm 61 years old. I'm in my 37th year as a college head coach, and I wonder where the time went. But I've, I've really been the luckiest guy in the world. I mean, I feel like any moment now, my mother is going to shake me and wake me up and tell me it's time to go to school. Like, this has just been one big dream for me. And uh, I've just been very fortunate to, to be at some wonderful institutions and coach some amazing young men. I've had great staff everywhere I go, including the current coach at the University of Virginia, Brian O'Connor, who was my assistant for nine years at Notre Dame during a point in my career. And, uh, you know, I've just been very lucky, you know, and, I, and, and when I see these young coaches out here that are, you know, coming to this clinic and, and trying to learn more about baseball and, and how to help young people develop as baseball players, you know, I see myself out there. You know, it just seems like yesterday that, you know, you're, you're, you're trying to learn as much as you can. I, I can remember sitting with coaches at the ABCA convention, the American Baseball Coaches Association, and uh, sitting with coaches and just talking, how do you teach hitting? How do you teach fielding? How do you teach a kid to throw a curveball? And, you know, all the, all the things that you can learn from other people, and uh, it all kind of meshes together and develops your own philosophy about how you're going to end up coaching kids. So, you know, I'm, I'm somewhat jealous of these young coaches out here that they're just starting out in their career, and I know my days are numbered. And uh, it's been a it's been a wonderful life to be able to to do what you do what you love and be able to make a living at it. And uh, I wish I could start all over again. Absolutely, and you know the fans in Baton Rouge are pretty crazy about LSU baseball. And you know for those listening who would really like a glimpse at what you look for you know, on the recruiting trail, but also, you know, what, what fits the mold of what an LSU Tiger looks like? So if, if you had to say, we look for these qualities and these are what we expect out of our players, what would some of those things be? Well, you know, one, one of the things I'm most proud about, Jonathan, and I don't want to make this sound egotistical because uh, it's, it's not meant that way, but I was very fortunate to have grown up the son of a coach. My, my father was a 30-year junior college coach and had an awful lot of success. In fact, when he retired from coaching uh, thir- after his 30 years, he was the first junior college coach to win a 1,000 games in his career. So he's the winningest coach in the history of junior college baseball. He had won a national championship. He had three second places and one third place finish and probably had 35 of his former players make it to the major league. So he had an inordinate amount of success. And yet he never really lost sight of the fact that he was a teacher. And that was why he went into it. And so, you know, my father uh, really was not only was a great father but he was a mentor for me and when I knew at a young age I wanted to be a coach 
uh, he kind of set the, the reasons for why you go into coaching. And basically, it is to impact young people's lives in, in many ways. So what I'm saying to you is I'm very proud of the fact that I've never really lost sight of why I went into coaching. Mm -hmm. Now, I've had four coaching jobs in college. I coached a small school, Division II school in Miami, Florida, St. Thomas University. Mm -hmm. And I went from there to the United States Air Force Academy, a Division I school, and then from there to the University of Notre Dame, which obviously is a, is a big-name school, and then finally here at LSU. So the pressure to win has kind of ratcheted it up with each passing job. Right. But I've never really lost sight of why I went into it. You know, it's, it's you know, like I, I've told people I, in, four, in 37 years of coaching, I've never thrown one ball. I've never batted once. I've never run the bases. I've never pitched. It's all about the kids. Sure. And that's what you got to do. You got to be a coach to help young people. And, uh, Sometimes we can lose sight of that because of the pressure of the job. You know, you have to win to keep your job. You know, you're in a tough conference, and the other teams are really good, and, and maybe some teams are doing some things that aren't as ethical as, as you would like to see people do it, but you can't lose your values. you got to maintain what is important to you and what you went into it for because at the end of the day, you still have to look at that guy in the mirror and like what you see. Right. And you have to believe in that you did it the right way and you believe in what you're doing and so forth. So the reason I tell you that is because you ask me, what kind of player are you looking for? Well, I need to have players that are going to do it the right way. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, we've said no to an awful lot of really good players through the years because I just didn't think they'd be a good fit with the, with the other players on our team. Sure. And what I'm looking for in players are guys that love the game, that are passionate about it. You know, God has blessed them with talent, obviously, mm -hmm. intelligence to be able to go to a, a good university, and, and obviously the ability as a baseball player. So when I sit them down in my office as I'm recruiting them, I basically tell them, I don't want you to come to LSU unless you're willing to commit to me that you want to become the very best baseball player that your God-given talent will allow you to be, mm -hmm. that you're going to go to school, that you're going to go to your classes, that you're going to do the work that you're required to do so that you can earn a college degree. And then I want you to be appreciative of this opportunity that you have. And one way to show you're appreciative of it is to go out into the community and help people that are not as fortunate as you are. I love it. And so when you combine those three things... Jonathan, that you have a player that's willing to commit himself to becoming the best player he's capable of being, that he's going to work hard in school to earn his college degree, and he's going to go out in the community and help people that are not as fortunate as he, haven't been blessed like he has been, then you end up with a pretty well-rounded young man. And if you have enough young men that share that same kind of commitment, and they have the talent you know, at our school, you know, you have to be successful as a team. We, you know, our, our fans are demanding, our administration is demanding. You know, we have 9,200 season ticket holders right. for a reason. And, and those SEC. people want you to win. And it's a tough league. So you have to recruit players that have the ability. But just having the ability is not enough. They have to have the right attitude. Definitely. And, you know, is that... It, say, say for instance, some of these guys out here, they are like, Coach, I want to come work for you, or I want to be a Division One assistant coach or head coach someday. Are those similar traits that you're looking for whenever you're trying to find different assistant coaches? Well, you know, I, just like when I recruit a player, I don't want to recruit a player unless he has aspirations of playing at the next level Definitely. and becoming a major league ball player. Now, most of them are not going to become major league ball players, but if they have that as a goal, then you know they're going to work hard, they're going to do things the right way. When I hire assistant coaches, I want to hire assistant coaches that have a goal of becoming a head coach because if they have that goal that they want someday to become a head coach, then they're going to constantly not only be working hard, but they're wanting to learn. And you, maybe they'll learn from me some things, but they can learn from each other, and they can certainly learn at events like this or the ABCA convention by talking to other people. And, uh, you know, when you have people that want to move move forward in the game that, to get better, 
to work at things, then usually they're going to do a pretty good job for you. And uh, you know the the you know when I again when I hire coaches, I want to know number one that they're going to work hard. Number two that they have the competence about the game and that they're going to improve. That number three they're going to be very loyal to the organization, to their coach, to the head coach, to the players, and that um, you know and that they feel privileged also to have this opportunity and I want coaches that are going to have high ethical values that aren't going to cheat they're going to work hard and do things the right way very cool now I am an assistant coach with the aspirations of being a head coach you know someday and and I love my head coach he's done a fantastic job of helping me to realize these different hey these are maybe someday head coaching moments now you also mentioned that you love to be able to grow your assistants to be head coaches someday are there some intentional ways that you try and help them to accomplish that just as they're working for you well Jonathan one one of the things I'm most proud of is that I have had 12 former assistant coaches That's awesome. become head coaches in college baseball mm-hmm. and again one of them the has been as successful as anyone is right here in Charlottesville, Virginia, Brian O'Connor. I'm just so proud of everything that Brian did. Well, when Brian was with me at Notre Dame, I hired him when he was 23 years old, Mm -hmm. and he was with me for nine years. And Brian could have left before he, he took the job at Virginia. He had other head coaching opportunities. But he would tell me, I'm not ready for that job. I'm not ready to be a head coach. How mature is that for a person to be able to self-analyze themselves and say, I don't want to be a head coach just to be a head coach. I want to do it when I'm ready. And so while Brian was my number one assistant, he was also still learning. Mm -hmm. And what I tried to do to help him grow is I empowered him and gave him an awful lot of of freedom. I didn't micromanage him. What we would do is we'd spend a lot of time in the office talking about different things, talking about players, talking about how we wanted to teach the pitchers to pitch and, you know, those type of things. But then when I let him go out on the – when he went out on the field, I didn't stand there looking over his shoulder. Sure. I, you know, I let him do it. And so the players on our team never thought for one second that I didn't agree with anything that Brian did. Mm-hmm. It, I think it's really important as a coaching staff that you can disagree with each other's behind closed doors. In fact, I encourage my coaching staff to disagree with me. I want them to, to think and to have opinions and so forth. But when we walk out that door, we're a unified group, mm-hmm. and nobody's going to ever say to a player, yeah, well, I wanted you to do this, but Coach Maneri decided to do this. But your players should never know what each coach on your staff felt about it because right. it's going to be a unified attitude, and this decision was made together, okay? Well, when Brian was with me, we – First of all, we hardly disagreed. I mean, it was so easy to work together. But I empowered Brian to go out there and to try different things and to work with the players. And if I saw something that I thought maybe he should do a little differently or whatever, I'd always talk to him about that privately. Right. And then he would go out there because he respected me. And he, if I was going to speak up and tell him something, he'd go out there and try to do something a little bit differently to – not necessarily satisfy me, but he understood that if I thought it was important enough to talk about. And so, you know, when Brian became a head coach at Virginia, the first thing I did was talk to his new assistant coaches. And I told them, listen, when Brian O'Connor worked for me for nine years, he was the most loyal person in the world. You know, so many coaches, when they become a head coach, you know, in the years leading up to being a head coach, they weren't loyal to the guy they were working for. They were always second-guessing him or talking behind his back or whatever. Then they become a head coach, and they expect their assistant coaches to be loyal to to, to them. Right. Well, you don't deserve that loyalty unless when you were in that position, you had unequivocal loyalty to your boss. And so the best advice I can give to these young assistant coaches and to yourself is to be loyal, work work hard for the person that you're that you're working with and working for and 
your day will come. And when your day comes to be a head coach, you want to demand loyalty out of your assistants because you know that you were loyal to the guy you were working for. And I told Brian's assistants that he deserves your loyalty because when he worked for me, he, he never, ever did anything that would give the slightest you know, uh, intention of not being completely loyal to me. I love that, and I love that answer. And, you know, before we get Coach O'Connor on the mic up here in just a second, you know, just talking to the guys that are out here, and you've been an awesome guest. I really appreciate you spending some time with us. But if there was something that you wanted to leave everybody here with, is there anything that comes to mind? Well, I I think being a coach, especially in this sport, where you have so much individual interaction with the players is a gr- is the greatest calling of any profession. I mean, I, r- I really do believe that because not only are you teaching youngsters how to get better as baseball players, better as athletes, but you're teaching them what it takes to be successful in the game of life. You know, you have to teach them to work with other people collectively. You have to teach them that through hard work they can make improvement. You have to teach them to have composure and poise when the pressure is the greatest. Uh, There's so many qualities that can be learned by these youngsters if the coach is doing it the right way with them. We, we may not get paid a lot of money. We may not win championships. We may not have a lot of success necessarily when it comes to, you know, those things that only the the outside people can see, the fans can see. But when you impact a young person's life, uh, you are a successful coach. And I, I hope that all of these men in this room that are going to be in this convention here this weekend will understand just how important their role is in these youngsters' lives. And they have to they have to walk the walk, they have to talk the talk, they have to do it. You know, they they gotta set as a role model the example for these young people. And if they do it, if they if they do things the right way, then these young kids will follow them and they'll become great members of society as well. Sure. I love that. Thanks, Coach. Okay, my pleasure. Thank you for listening to Ahead of the Curve. Before you go, I'd love to be able to get in touch with you, and we have several different ways of doing so. You can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at AOTC underscore podcast. You can join the AOTC Coaches Facebook group. And if you want to be a part of the mini clinic emails, both of those links are listed below. If you enjoyed the show, please consider leaving us a rating or review to help others find and stay ahead of the curve.